Garrett Cat, come on down to talk about Environmental Resilience Program. Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, great to be back here again this morning. So. I'm going to start off talking about the Environmental Resilience Program, which is a BHP Foundation supported program that the people who were we introduced yesterday are all here representing. So, um, see how we go. Uh, so, the Environmental Resilience Programs that are here today they work on large, globally significant natural environments. Um, this work is centred on people uh, wherever in the world these projects are. And so, for many places, it's traditional owners, um, First Nations people. Uh, the landholders, the people that are really connected to the place and the country that they live. Um, now, we were talking about this yesterday. I'm a little bit nervous. I normally don't get nervous when I'm talking because I'm talking about something I really know, but now I feel like I'm representing a whole lot of people. So bear with me while I try and read through notes, which is not something that I'm used to doing. Um, so project managers, we often really paint a rosy picture of what we're doing, about how great things are, how much we're achieving, you know, it keeps us all motivated, it keeps us moving, keeps us strong. Um, but the, the issues, the topics that we work on, they come from problems. You know, most of the things that start us off are, hey, we've see, seen a problem with the environment over there, we want to try and get moving on that issue over here, we've got climate change coming in impacting all these things. So the Environmental Resilience Program is about addressing those problems and finding solutions. So you know, here in Australia, you know, those solutions that we're working on, we're bringing people together, you know, connecting people up, bringing everyone into a room like this to share those stories and working on problems, you know, everybody will laugh, I'll start with fire, you know, that's a big, big issue that we work on. We're talking about climate change, we're talking about things that impact people and communities. Um, this is really the same story right across the globe and this is what links these environmental resilience programs together. So for people in Palau, the challenges you know, include governance you know, and managing traditional resources in a modern context. We'll hear from Lolita on some of the issues in that country, and that country is surrounded by tropical seas and coral reefs, you know, small island, island nation. Chile is working on building a conservation framework that supports a connected corridor of diverse natural places in South America. There's no effective system of national parks or IPAs like we have here in Australia that protects the central part of Chile. So the country, um, so finding ways to conserve private lands is critical for that country's unique Mediterranean environments. And we have the Canadians here as well who are working on managing important cultural resources that sustain their communities. Uh, it's in a wildly different environment to the one that we work in. There are still similar issues to here, including how to create enduring protected areas where generations can carry out future generations can carry out cultural practice on country. So I'll let all the projects speak for themselves. We're, uh, we're condensing it down. We've got about 20 minutes to get through total. Um, and I'll come up and try and conclude things at the end. But I'll, I'll just ask the leader and Sarah just to come up. We might get the, the rest of the crew to come up as well, just so we can move through it nice and quickly so they can introduce their programs. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me at this amazing conference. I'm really honoured to be here. I've learned so much from you all, so thank you. Um, so the Resilient Reefs Initiative is an initiative which is focused on coral reefs and the communities that are supported by those coral reefs. We work in uh, four sites around the world, so Palau being one of them, where Lolita's from, which is pretty much straight north of where we're sitting now. So that's the Rock Island Southern Lagoon that you can see on the map there. We also work in New Caledonia, um, Ningaloo in Western Australia, and out uh, Belize in the Caribbean. So we really focus on supporting communities, government, governments, and um, the coral reef systems themselves in the face of climate change and increasing local pressures. Um, coral reef ecosystems, like your amazing, beautiful desert country, are incredibly important for biodiversity and for people. Um, so, you know, coral reefs take up about a footprint, uh, about a 1% footprint of the whole of our oceans, but about 25% of all marine life rely on coral reefs to survive. There's also over a billion people that rely on coral reefs for food security and um, nutrition and livelihoods. 
And then coral reefs also play an amazing role in storm protection. So, you know, there's a reason that people don't surf in Queensland, in the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage catchment areas. And that's because the Great Barrier Reef breaks all of that impact from the swell coming into that area. So they play an incredible role in storm protection, which is often really undervalued. We're starting to see a little bit more of, rec of the recognition of storm protection and the other ecosystem services that coral reefs play now. Um, but it's something that we really want to see move um, more quickly. So I will hand over to Lolita, who will actually tell us a story about what, how um, Resilient Reefs is playing out at the local level. Thank you, Sarah. Ali, Miltutao, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for your kind hospitality and uh, very warm, um, you know, um, exchange of uh, information and brotherly love and sisterly love. Um, so, as Sarah has uh, introduced the world of coral reefs uh, to us, Palau um, is an island nation, is a coastal island nation. You can imagine we rely on our coral reefs for our daily living. Our way of life depends on the, our reef and our ocean. Um, fish is the one is the most important protein to us. Um, it's if you're a Palawan male, if you're a brother, you have to feed your sister with the, only the best fish. If you're a wife, you have to feed your mother-in-law with even the better, more better and bigger uh, fish, and it all has to be white meat. Um, and we're very, I mean, we know our fish. We know where it's caught from. Um, and so you can imagine it's something that if it disappears in our lives, probably um, infringes upon our own identity as Palauans and as island people. So for, for traditionally, the chiefs have been in charge of governing all resources. Um, they manage the fish. They tell you when, uh, when and where to fish and when and where not to fish. Um, it's always been abundant until, of course, you know, as time evolves in, in these modern times and modern government com came in, um, th that responsibility started to disintegrate with the ambiguity between the role of the government and the role of the traditional chiefs. So, for so long, our fish, especially our reef fish, were left unmanaged until quite only recently, with the help of an Australian scientist, we um, came to understand that um, every, for every catch and, or every landings that are made, at least 60% or more of the landings are juvenile fish. That told us that the, the reefs are overfished, the, the populations are not able to replenish, and that we face a crisis of our fish population that could crash. Um, my organization, Palau Conservation Society, uh, we um, approached the chiefs at um, the community, at the state of Koror, and the state government. We talked to them about the issue, and they welcomed our effort to work with them to find solutions. The solutions mainly came from the, the fishermen, the modern and the traditional fishermen, the chiefs, and the state government. Um, the, the group identified something like over 48 traditional fishing grounds. And this is an area that Sarah had in the, in the uh, presentation. The, the entire region is uh, called the Rock Island Southern Lagoon, is a world-renowned dive site. So it already is um, a very, um, it's a, an international destination for scuba divers, um, as well as snorkelers. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So already the fishermen were sort of an outcast from their own traditional fishing grounds. Um, but they, they came together, and they identified the fishing grounds, and they um, identified 22 species of fish. Uh, that um, that they agreed on measures to try and recover the population 
and uh, have management measures in place and sustain the, the population. So um, it's, it's, it's been quite a, a lesson for us. Um, we, know, we knew we couldn't make do this without or set ourselves um, on the road to uh, recovery for the, our fish population. If we didn't have the, our traditional chiefs agreeing to it, our fishermen, our state government, as well as our partners like um, Resilient Reefs Initiative. So thank you, everybody. And uh, if you have any more questions about Palau, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Hello, buenos dias. Our mother tongue is Spanish, uh, so we don't speak English too well, but I hope you'll understand us. Uh, we come from Chile. We were, three years ago, a one-person organization. Now we've become bigger. And we have a huge uh, and ambitious challenge uh, in front of us. Uh, the first thing that I discovered not recently is that Australia and Chile were connected many, many years ago. We found fossils of eucalyptus south of the place we're working, so the, we have things in common. And our uh, challenge is a little bit like yours in a way that our landscape, the landscape we're trying to protect, it's called the Mediterranean ha uh, landscape. It's found only in five places in the world. It's found here in Australia too. And it's where most people live. It's really a really nice place to live in. But people don't recognize it's important. It's a little bit like the desert here. People don't live here, but they, they don't appreciate it. It's the same for us. Less than 1% is protected, and most of it is in private hands. And when we say private hands, it's just not public lands. It's everybody's land, families, communities, corporations. Uh, and we're trying to create a framework for them to protect their beautiful properties. We, uh, we face all the threats that you can imagine from our biggest cities being located right out of this landscape. It's 80% uh, privately owned, and we have many, many uh, endangered, endemic species that are only found in this landscape. Chile is a little bit like an island, like Australia. It's surrounded by the ocean, the Andes, very high mountains, the driest desert in the world, much more drier than this one, and the Antarctica. So these species are only found here, and they're really, really endangered. We have uh, intensive agriculture. This is where most of our food is cultivated, uh, mining, real estate, everything you can imagine. Uh, and it's really, really, really hard to work trying to make that sustainable. And what we've discovered at the beginning, we were very technical thinking of what instruments, methodologies, uh, no, indicators we could use to protect this landscape. And then we find out that it was working with people. Uh, and this is a few shots from our recent workshops with people that live around the landscape that we're trying to protect. And what we find is that they understand the landscape much better than we thought they would. So they are teaching us. And they have also become our eyes uh, in the landscape. We, we live in a very crowded city. We go to these beautiful places as much as we can, but we need to have eyes and hearts near the properties that we're trying to protect. So this is the people that have become our park rangers, a little bit like you are. We are training each other, uh, and we are learning about how to uh, make this place something somewhere that we can uh, share with our future generations. Thank you. Tanse, uh, Amanda Karst, Disnakasen. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Amanda Karst. Um, I work for Nature United. Um, it's the Canadian affiliate of the Nature Conservancy. And uh, the project uh, I wanted to talk to you about um, is situated right in the center of Canada, in the heart of the boreal. And so specifically the project area is a forestry tenure, a nine million hectare forestry tenure. And there are 10 First Nations and the Manitoba Métis Nation that call this place home. Um, and I'm really excited to have representatives from two of those First Nations here with me today. 
Um, and so the approach of our organization is really around working in partnership uh, with those indigenous communities um, and supporting the work that they want to do to fulfill their cultural responsibilities to take care of their territories. Uh, so before I hand it over, what, thank you. <laughs> I just want to show some photos um, to give you an image of the boreal. So uh, the boreal is covered in forest uh, with trees like jack pine and black spruce, and there's wetlands and interspersed freshwater lakes and rivers. Um, but I thought these photos um, show the landscape a bit from an indigenous perspective uh, because the land is covered uh, with traditional foods and medicines. And so we've got moose in the top right and in the top left corner we've got uh, whitefish and moose meat drying over the fire. Um, and then we've got wild blueberries uh, which really are a really important berry for folks. And then we have spruce gum, Labrador tea and wikis which is a medicine that's found um, underground. Um, so these foods and medicines are everywhere and I think they just give a tiny little snapshot of um, that relationship people have to these lands um, and how important they are. So I'm going to pass it over to Bobby. Thank you. Bobby Ballantyne Snigasen, Mr. Paistik Nina. Uh, hello everyone. My spirit name is White Bear Man. My English name is Bobby Ballantyne. I'm from Mississippi Cree Nation and it's a beautiful day today. Um, so our Kanawanishigo guardians, it translate to peop it translates to people who are looking after the land. It was developed in nineteen or it's 2018 to assert MCN rights and title to the territory and restore the knowledge of natural laws that come from the land. Our guardians are made up of land users, hunters, trappers, fishermen, and youth. Uh, we all have a common goal and that's to protect the land, water, and animals. Uh, we chose to monitor three, three of our important things as uh, fish and moose are are um, sustainable, or uh, it's a significant food source for our people um, and water quality as we are directly impacted from a hydroelectric dam that's just located about two kilometers north up, sh up river of our community. Yeah, thanks. Benjamin Young. I am the land manager for the Wisquaisipi First Nation, and uh, I want to thank the Creator for bringing us all here together and gathering here, share knowledge, create networks, and help each other. I. Uh, come from the Cree and Anishinaabe tribes of North America. We're the biggest, the Cree people are the biggest tribe in uh, North America, so it spreads almost all the way across the continent. I, uh, I'm really glad to be here and thank you for allowing me to come here and the invite and welcoming, you know, it's good to see so many beautiful faces and souls and I feel such uh, good energy when I'm here, so I met some really good people. So I want to say thank you. Squacy Peak First Nation is in the process of developing their land guardians program, which is similar to what you guys call rangers. We're concerned about the impacts on the territory. If this program will be derived of monitor watering quality and quantity and moose monitoring. We had an elder by the name of Buddy Brass. He's uh, inducted into the Manitoba Hall of Fame for uh, baseball. He, very good ball player. <laughs> so, uh, and he was a well-respected elder, not just around Manitoba, but also Canada. 
he has since passed on. So one of his last wishes was that if you look on the bottom right-hand corner, you see a map with a red line on the east side of Swan Lake. That uh, lake right there. And uh, all that in between from the east side of that red line to that body of water, he asked to be protected as that's where our people practiced uh, and preserved culture, language, tradition. So we're in the process of doing that and creating an indigenous protected area with four other First Nations and the Métis Nation. And I just want to say thank you. So thanks everybody for giving us the time to, to introduce some of these you know, visitors who've come a very long way um, to talk to you all. And you know, I get the great privilege of sitting down with these people and talking to them a lot. I think it would be a great opportunity for you while they're here to have a conversation because you know, what we've found is that there is a lot of commonality in what we do. You know, we're bound together by you know, the need to work to people, the need to work together, the need to work urgently. Um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of challenges in the world at the moment. So the more that we can work together, bring people into this collab collaboration, um, the better results we can get. So thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day today. See you.